If you want to support the platform, just in case anything like this happens again, you can do it by way of PayPal, Patreon, uh, Cash App, and also by um, the Anchor. And you can also further support the platform by way of going to the uh, the Teespring store or um, the shoe store that is located in the comment section below. Salt Lake City Police Department released a timeline today providing additional information on the agency's response to a homicide of Ryan Outlaw that occurred in the fall of 2020. In November of 2020, Fernanda Tobar, age 22, was arrested on suspicion of murder in the stabbing death of her boyfriend, Ryan Outlaw, age 39. Tobar initially stated that she was full of rage and was undergoing jealousy issues the night her boyfriend died. As of recently, there has been controversy regarding the department's management of this incident. SLCPD states that there were four 911 calls made related to the case. 5.56 p.m. The first 911 call was made to SLCPD with reports of yelling between a man and a woman on the seventh floor of the Cavey apartment in downtown Salt Lake City. SLCPD states that the caller did not know if the incident involved any physical fighting. Documents state that, quote, the caller advised that they could not see any weapons and that the two involved people, a man and a woman, later identified to be Mr. Outlaw and Miss Fernanda Tobar, were going back and forth between an apartment unit and the hallway. According to police reports, while on the line, the SLC 911, the caller, quote, advised everything has gone quiet, but the department stated that they would still dispatch officers to the scene and ask the caller to call back if anything changed or if more information surfaced. Official documents stated that the call was coded as domestic, just ordered, based on the information provided by the first caller and was given a priority two classification, which means it was not in progress and there was no activity emergency, no active emergency requiring police to expedite their response with lights and sirens, nor the need to pull an officer off the call to respond. SLCPD notes that at the time that the first call happened, that there was no officers available to respond to the incident and that there was no evidence provided by the caller that suggested Mr. Outlaw had been stabbed. 6.16 p.m. Records state that the SLC 911 dispatched the call to the first available officer who went en route immediately. 6.21 p.m. The second 911 call was made to SLCPD from the first caller with reports of a woman screaming for help. The caller provided a possible apartment number on the seventh floor of the complex to where the disturbance originated. 6.23 p.m. SLCPD arrived on scene. Simultaneously, the third 911 call was made to SLCPD from an apartment resident with reports of a verbal and physical argument that she witnessed between two neighbors. Quote, while on the phone call with SLC 911, the caller advised that someone may have been stabbed based on what they heard and saw from the apartment. One minute after this call began at 624, SLCPD states that the caller asked if she should go out and get help. Quote, the SLC 911 dispatcher told the caller to stay inside for safety. 624 p.m. The fourth 911 call was made to SLCPD from another apartment residence with reports of a domestic disturbance. Police advised the caller that officers were on scene. 625 p.m. SLCPD records state that an officer notified dispatch to call for emergency medical services for Mr. Outlaw, who appeared to have a stab wound to the chest as that the scene was declared safe for paramedics. While waiting for emergency personnel to arrive, records state that, quote, the officers maintain continuous awareness of Mr. Outlaw's condition, urging him to get into a recovery position, attempted to ask Ms. Tobar what happened to Mr. Outlaw and had to prevent Ms. Tobar from leaving the scene. It's important to note that police records state nothing about attempts to provide aid to Mr. Outlaw during the time officers were waiting for medical personnel to arrive. 6.27 p.m. The department provided a condition update of Mr. Outlaw for responding medical units. 6.35 p.m. 
SLCPD arranged for Mr. Outlaw to be transported to the hospital by Gold Cross in critical condition. Hopkins Medical Center listed critical condition as the most extreme patient condition before death. Noting that when a patient is in critical condition, quote, vital signs are unstable and not within normal limits. Patients may be unconscious. Indicators for indicators are unfavorable. Final call, 8.06 p.m. Doctors officially declared Mr. Outlaw deceased. A statement from SLCPD regarding their response to the incident reads in part, quote, on certain calls such as shooting just occurred and stabbing just occurred, SLC 911 will preemptively dispatch emergency medical services in this case. Since there was no information about an injury prior to 6.23 p.m., medical was not staged earlier. The department also adds, quote, the Salt Lake City Police Department stands by its two police officers who initially responded to this call for service. They are outstanding police officers who have repeatedly dedicated themselves to protecting and serving our community. A woman who was given a sentence of probation in relation to her boyfriend's homicide that occurred in the fall of 2020 is now at large after being released from jail on June 23rd. In November of 2020, Fernanda Tobar, age 22, was arrested on suspicion of murder in the stabbing death of her boyfriend, Ryan Outlaw, age 39. Tobar initially stated that she was full of rage and was undergoing jealousy issues the night her boyfriend died. Tobar was initially charged with first-degree felony manslaughter, though she was later found guilty to a reduced charge of third-degree manslaughter by a jury in December of 2021. Tobar received a prison sentence of 1 to 15 years. She was ordered to serve 180 days in jail and was released on June 23rd of 2022. Following her release, she was sentenced to 60 months of probation. However, adult probation and parole, APMP, was divulged that Tobar failed to show up for probation and that at this time her whereabouts are unknown. A Nobel warrant was issued for Tobar's arrest on July 21st. This is from a November 2020 article. Goes as stated, Tobar is accused of knifing outlaw who was a father to four sons to death in their home in Salt Lake City, Utah on Friday night. A neighbor called 911 after hearing outlaw scream, help me from inside his apartment. Police were called to the scene and found Tobar helping her bleeding boyfriend out of an elevator. Outlaw who moved to Salt Lake City from his native Texas was rushed to a nearby hospital where he later died. Tobar was arrested and reportedly admitted, quote, hitting outlaw with a knife at least twice. She stated that she and her boyfriend had spent the day drinking liquor and that the mood had deteriorated over an unspecified jealousy issue. The alleged murderer said the outlaw had pushed her chest, had pushed her chest with both hands while she was against the counter. She stated that he let her go, but that she was still furious about the incident and that she began throwing items of furniture out the window of their apartment. Outlaw began to walk towards the door to leave, prompting Tobar to pick up a blade and hit him in the chest as she claimed. It was also later reported that Outlaw began bleeding from the stab wound with Tobar calling an ambulance. Police later found a bloody knife inside the couple's home. So let me try to piece this together. She's stating that she has jealousy issues, right? So more than likely, she found out that he was talking to somebody. Somebody was interested in him or he might have, you know, went out and did something. More than likely, they are or are not together or they have some type of open relationship, what have you, right? So she got jealous about the information. They were both drinking. She decided uh, to, in a sense, get heated about the situation, right? He decided during that heated exchange that he was just going to sit up there and push her, not strike her, anything like that. She basically stated he let her go. So everybody, in a sense, cooled down at that moment. She decided that she wanted to retaliate by throwing items directly at or well, out the window. And he was like, you know what, whatever it is, I'm going to just sit up there and go out the door. So I want people to pay attention, right? Everything was already heated because people were already inebriated, right? Both people are directly in the wrong, right? So we just got that clear. So the moment in time that some type of logic 
directly hits this man's mind. He's like, you know what? Let me get out of here before, you know, this even gets worse. She then, when he's trying to leave the situation, a heated situation that he knows can potentially get worse in the state of mind that the state of mind that he's in being inebriated, she decides that she wants to magically get a knife and she wants to stab him. She wants to stab him. This is what I'm talking about here. Right. And this is something that does not get talked about enough when it comes to uh, domestic violence. Nobody really talks about how it is that either a man, of course, you know, can just so happen to be in a wrong during if he's inebriated or maybe if he's uh, enraged or whatever it is. But then he decides to get a cooler mind and he's like, you know what, let me duck out or maybe or just maybe it was just an argument, just words. And the dude is like, you know what, let me leave out. Right. So I'm saying in any one of those scenarios, the point is the guy is leaving. Logic kicked in. He's like, yo, I'm not going to make this worse. I'm not going to allow it to get worse. Let me just separate myself from this so that cooler heads can prevail. And, and, and maybe we can sit up there and figure some stuff out later. You have too many women out here that feel that they can do certain things, that they're enabled by society to do certain things to men in order to stop them from leaving because they feel like it. And this is why a lot of people happen to say that you have women out here who are emotional. That, that's an emotional woman. She knew exactly what she wanted to do. She felt a certain type of way. She was like, oh, well, if you're not going to be here with me, then, you know, the kids just ain't going to have a father. Stab, stab. That's what she did. So now the father that was, in a sense, staying around because he wanted to be a father figure for his kids. cannot. He, he now can't even be a father figure. Because she didn't rob that. She didn't took that directly from them. And more than likely, you're going to have people sit up there and say, well, he should have kept his hands to himself and all this other type of stuff. So you mean to tell me that, and more than likely, this is not the first time that they've had something like this before. More than likely. Because like I said before, they were both inebriated. When people are inebriated, you know, people tend to sit up there and talk and say things and all this other type of stuff, right? So, as I stated before, she was inebriated as well. So, they knew exactly what they was doing. They knew exactly what they were saying. Because proof of which, he was like, yo, I done sat up there and in a sense took it too far. Let me, you know, let me just leave the situation, right? Maybe somewhere in there. I'm not sure if the kids are there or not, but I'm just assuming, right? Maybe the kids were there. And he was like, you know what? Let me just, some some sobered up real quick. He was like, you know what? I can't, I can't sit up there and do this. Uh, I, you know, I can't allow my sons to basically see me, you know, treat their, their mother or, or, or whatnot like this. I can't do that. So let me leave out of this situation, even though I'm wrong. Let me leave, leave out the situation as the man that I am right now and, you know, try to come back and, you know, figure some stuff out later. Couldn't even do that. Couldn't even do that. But like I said before, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to say, oh, well, you know, if he didn't sit up there and do this or that, then, you know, maybe he would still be alive. Maybe, you know, people should just keep their, their hands to themselves. Look here. This is my thing. At the point in time, she was not in any type of fear of her life. Like I said before, yeah, he was wrong for what he did. But at no point in time did she state that she was afraid. At no point in time did she state that she was in fear of her life. What did she say? She said she had a jealousy issue and a jealous rage problem. All of that was emotional. Nothing in there said anything about fear. Oh, he was bigger than me. He was stronger than me. He looked like Hercules and I was just a little girl. No, it, it wasn't none of that. She decided to consciously take this man's life because she's an emotional, unstable creature. And because she's emotionally unstable, she decided, oh, let me get a knife because you're with these other women and you're not technically with me. You're only here because the kids are here. So ain't nobody going to have you. And then when she decided to do that, then she wanted to call the ambulance and start the crying and all this other type of stuff, help him out the elevator and all this other type of stuff. Like I said, this is this is a thousand percent crazy. My question is, so what about the kids? What, what's going to happen to the kids now? Where are they going to go? Do they have other family that they're staying with? Does, you know, CPS have them? Like, how old were the kids? Were they around? Did they hear anything? Did they see anything? 
Like there's still unanswered questions there because the main thing is police can't even find it right now. So you have a murderer directly out there on the loose because you decided to let her go. You gave her probation. That's ridiculous. You found the knife. She told you what it is that she did. And you were like, well, <laughs> jealous rage woman uh, probation on top of that uh we think he's black yeah probation it's cool it's cool probation so now when she didn't respond and she didn't show up to her adult parole officer or whatever it is to let them know what's going on now she pulled a houdini but i promise you some way somehow she's out there seeing those kids i bet you that she out there seeing family like I said, why is it that the police don't have tabs on her family, on her friends, people who are associates? Why are they not going through her Facebook and trying to figure out people who uh, live within the area so they can try to triangulate some stuff and to see if they can, you know, find her? Why aren't they trying to check the cell phone towers to see if she might be using uh, 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 the same number, like cell phone number that she might be registered with? Why they're not talking to the kids to see if potentially she might have came and saw the kids? Like I said, she is a mother. She more than likely went to go visit her kids at one point in time or another. I promise you they more than likely saw or heard of her or by word of other family members. They know, you know, what was taking place. And then the other problem is for all for all of those boys that don't have a father. What is the story that is being told to them? Are they being told to basically hate their father because all of this is his fault? And their mother was just defending herself versus their big bad father. Or is the truth actually being put out that your mom has a jealousy issue and she took your father's life because she can't handle or control her emotions? I promise you it's more than likely the first one. That the father was the big bad wolf. He was the enemy and she had to protect herself because that's usually how stuff likes to go. You have a lot of actors. You have a lot of people that want to play these crying games whenever it comes to them committing these murders. Magically, they want to break down, be emotional, start crying these crocodile tears to gain sympathy and empathy from whoever else. And then they want to, you know, try to uh, 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 make the man as the big bad wolf when realistically he wasn't. The big bad wolf was the woman the whole time. It was the mother. The main person that was there that decided to take this father away from his four sons. So I just want to put that as a reminder for people that want to say that men don't want to be fathers. They don't want to be around and all this other type of stuff. They they always abandon their responsibilities. You had a man that was there. But because he was there, because they already had a fractured or a broken relationship, the situation was already bad. But he tried to make do with what it is. He tried to have a, a, a amicable relationship so that the kids can, in a sense, uh, you know, be raised around or have something of a, a, a family structure. But all of that is destroyed now. And now she's a single mother. Look at that. See how that works. But like I said before, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you have simps and you have other people that will sit up there and say, it's still that black man's fault. Because if he didn't sit up there and do what he did, then none of this would have happened. But yet none of them would want to acknowledge the fact that the woman stated that she is an unstable creature and she could not control her emotions, which led her to consciously stab and take the life of her boyfriend slash father of her four kids.